fresh meat. Now, if I was to say Resident Evil movie, the first thing that would pop into your head would likely be Mila Jovovich kicking ass in a variety of ways through the barren wasteland filled with all sorts of different zombies, getting more and more ridiculous with each passing film. But did you know that before Paul W.S. Anderson was ever involved in this series, we were almost given an adaptation from one of horror's greatest minds? But to tell the story of what came to be, we have to go back, way back all the way to 1968. Zombies. These shambling creatures have captured the imagination of audiences all over the world, and we owe it all to George A. Ramiro, the man who created what we know as the modern day zombie. His seminal classic, Night of the Living Dead, brought about everything we grew to expect from zombies. The slow, stumbling walk, the decaying body, and the taste for human flesh. He continued with the zombie genre, bringing us classics like Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. We won't talk about the others. This trilogy of films helped shape zombies in cinema, but it wasn't just cinema that was affected. Through the 80s and 90s, video games roared in popularity, and before too long, the zombies followed. In 1996, Capcom released Resident Evil, or as it was known in Japan, Biohazard. This survival horror game took the world by storm, frightening audiences globally. Set in a mysterious mansion, the player is part of the STARS team, STARS standing for Special Tactics and Rescue Service, and is tasked with surviving the horrors within, and discovering the mystery behind it all. Your main antagonists in the game are the stereotypical zombies that Ramiro had sculpted decades before with the reason behind them being a substance known as the T-Virus. But rather than just some slow-moving corpses to disrupt your mission as the player, other animals were also zombified, including dogs, sharks, plants, snakes, and whatever this thing is. And you're tasked with finding out where these creatures came from and if they can be stopped. Sure, the lore gets more and more complicated with every game, and even coming to present day where the series is more Texas Chainsaw Massacre than classic zombie story. But with that first game in the series, it was simply surviving the night and uncovering the mystery behind it all. Its sequel, Resident Evil 2, was released in 1998 and expanded the story outside the mansion and into the streets of the nearby metropolis, Raccoon City. With video games gaining more and more steam, and the success of the first game still looming over, promotion for the sequel stepped into high gear. Enter George Romero. George hadn't made a movie since 1993's The Dark Half, and was in the midst of a bit of a career slump. Thankfully, being known as the godfather of the zombie genre made Romero an easy hire by Capcom to create a live action trailer for the game. So he got to work taking a small commercial shoot and making it more akin to a film production, making it much more stylized than other commercials of the era. He cast Brad Renfro of At Pupil and The Client fame as Leon Kennedy and Adrian France as Claire Redfield. The zombie makeup was done by Japanese special effects maker Screaming Mad George who had worked on A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors, and A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. The footage ended up being cut into two distinct ads. The first was very basic, with Leon loading his gun, Claire walking in like a badass, and the two of them exiting to go kick some zombie ass. Biohazard. The other included a bunch of quick cuts of Leon, Claire, and a horde of zombies, while only released in Japan and titled Biohazard 2, the commercials were a big success. This was enough to get the executives at Capcom interested in making a film. And who better than the godfather of zombies, who they already had a working relationship with. They partnered with Constantine Films, a German company that had made films such as The Neverending Story, Seven, and eventually what would become the first Resident Evil. The film started development with George set to write and direct. And if you're a fan of the first game, of which the movie is based, you'll likely love a lot of what Ramiro's script brought to the table. 
The screenplay features Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, and Albert Wesker, all staples of the game universe, and their descent onto the mansion. And it's non-stop action set piece after action set piece the entire time. The script is more akin to Aliens than any of Ramiro's dead films. It's not all roses, though. There are some questionable choices made by Ramiro. For one, he made Chris Redfield a Native American farmer who is dating Jill Valentine, rather than the badass stars member that he is in the game. He's also a far cry from the heroic protagonist we're used to. Instead, he's a bit of a bumbling idiot. Their idea of a joke. Doing several things throughout the script that forgo any sort of intelligence, and serve more to advance the story. The antagonists of the film are where the script really shines. Everything feels like a threat here. Zombies are treated with respect, and are still able to get their fair share of the body count, rather than just fodder for the stars members. Then there's the zombie dogs, zombie sharks, zombie plants, and even Tyrant. A big scary bastard that the Mila Jovovich films kind of... Well, they neutered. Now, these things may sound crazy, but they're all part of the Resident Evil universe. So if anything can be rightfully criticized of Romero's script, it's definitely not the fan service. The story is simple. We follow Bravo Team, headed by Jill Valentine, as she and her team are sent to explore a mansion with little to no details of the terror that awaits. With Jill's inclusion, we're intended to believe that this is the team we'll be following through the movie. Nope, almost as quickly as the team is introduced, they are each taken out in gruesome ways by an unknown violent group of creatures. Even Jill's fate is left up in the air. Then we're introduced to the other stars group, Alpha Team. This is headed up by Albert Wesker, with the rest of the rather large group of team members being named after characters from the original game. Their mission is to find out what happened to Bravo Team, and extract a scientist named John Marcus. They descend onto the mansion and, oh, remember Chris? And that he's now a farmer? Well. The only reason he's reintroduced to the story is because his farm is near the mansion, and he follows Alpha Team there. Why Ramiro didn't just make him another member of Stars is beyond me, but what this does is give Chris a familiarity with the mansion due to growing up in the area, so he's seemingly aware of all these secret passages around the property. Convenient. All of the characters move through the mansion, and scene by scene, they all get dispatched in a variety of brutal ways, ranging from zombie bites, to melted by acid, to having all their blood sucked out of them. It's an intense thrill ride, never knowing quite who will make it out alive. At one point, Chris has an encounter with zombie sharks that could be either incredibly intense or incredibly cheesy based on the effects. But this was 1998 and effects weren't exactly up to snuff for most of the visual gags that the script included. Moving vines, a monstrous plant creature, glass being shattered letting in a tank of water, these are all very expensive gags for what Constantine Films just saw as a zombie movie, but they couldn't fault Ramiro for being true to the game. One thing that fans of the game series will love is the inclusion of the red, blue, and green key cards. In the series, these are items you need to collect in order to advance to different areas. Sure, it's a silly video game mechanic, but it's nice to see it included in the script. One really bad aspect of Ramiro's proposed film is the dialogue. It ranges from hokey to bad, and could really use a polish from someone that isn't Ramiro. But the structure of the script is where it succeeds the most. The story progresses like a roller coaster and never gives you a moment to breathe. Perfect for a Resident Evil movie. Unfortunately, executives at Constantine Films weren't a fan of any of Ramiro's drafts, calling them much too violent. They wanted it to be shown in cinemas and on television in Germany. And this level of violence just wouldn't do. Apparently, the executives at Constantine had never played a Resident Evil game before. Or seen a Romero movie. With that, and the rather pricey budget, George was fired from the production, and the film went into limbo. That is, until a young upstart named Paul W.S. Anderson came along and decided he would take the opposite approach to Romero. While George was a slave to the game, honoring far more than we would see nowadays, Anderson wanted to only use the basic concept, forgoing all characters from the game. Instead, he opted to create an entirely new character named Alice and provide a very basic version of the story. Oh, and clearly Constantine had changed their minds on the violence at some point. As we all know, we were then given a Resident Evil series that shoehorned in characters from the video games without any real substance. 
and progressively made the Alice character into more and more of a superhero. While the George Romero script may not have given us cinematic gold, it would have been a fairly faithful adaptation of the video game series. Although, if things didn't go how they did, I guess we wouldn't have gotten this scene. So maybe all is forgiven. Maybe. <laughs>